Um, John, you want to get started? Sure. Uh, I'm John Murky. Um, I'm a consultant with uh, Bylight Consulting. Um, most of the time I am participating in HL7 or IHE standards bodies. Um, I'm co-chair of IHE IT in, uh, infrastructure. Um, and I am co-chair in HL7 on the security work group and a member of the fire management group. Um, I do have, uh, you know, some development uh, uh, contacts. Uh, the, the most visible is that I am consulting uh, with the VA on the My Healthy Vet, uh, so patient portals use of fire. Got it. Got it. Awesome. And Naveen, you want to do a quick intro on your side? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll do a very quick intro. Uh, uh, Josh, as you know, um, I've been in the digital health business for many, many years. I've been in the industry over 32 years. I've spent about 20 of those in the world of digital health. Uh, most recently, I was the CTO at a company called uh, Sharecare. I left that company several weeks ago. Uh, and at the moment, I'm just you know, trying to understand the world of uh, you know, EHR data, EMR data, what are the rules and the regulations surrounding the availability of uh, any, uh, you know, um, uh, medical record data, which I, which I define as, you know, data that is, that is hosted by payers, as well as data that is hosted in the EMR and the EHR systems, as well as any of the systems that any of the uh, lab vendors might have that contain individual lab information, lab data for the user. So anything that pertains to a user, the medical records, you know, I want to understand, you know, what the lay of the land is. Uh, data availability has been a huge challenge. You know, I've seen over the course of the last 22 years that uh, that data has increasingly become available, which is really good news because we know that a lot of very um, uh, cool applications can be developed when data is available. I've been part of uh, companies that have used that data to build really worthwhile applications. You know, I was the CTO at uh, Castlight Health, where we build the transparency products by mining claims data. I was the CEO at Obeo Health, where we build decision support systems, again, with the whole purpose of mining claims data, uh, doing deep analytics on claims data, and then giving people advice on how they could negotiate uh, the world of, you know, um, of, of, of premiums and out-of-pocket costs and manage their overall spend and also understand the implications of the plan choices that they typically have available to them at the time of open enrollment, have, helping them understand their EOBs, their bills, uh, dealing with uh, gaps in care, you know, uh, many, many such things hold with the entire purpose of making feel, people feel better. At the moment, uh, I'm taking a break and I am, again, just evaluating, you know, what data is available. Uh, I've been, been thinking of some ideas that can leverage data, and that's how I connected with Josh. Awesome, and I guess I'm kind of the common link here. I, I had a chance to meet up with Naveen in the, the Bay Area a few weeks ago, and we kind of chatted about this, this space of consumer access in particular and um, the development that's happening on the EHR side as part of the certification program. Uh, but what we didn't have a chance to do was really get into the, the details of like, what are some of the developer experiences? What are the, the portal and app registration steps like? What could some of the stumbling blocks be? Um, and then I was having a conversation with John over, over chat last week um, on these kind of overlapping topics. So I'm glad to get to talk to you both together. Uh, and you know, I'll say from, from my perspective, one thing I'd love to just put a, a concrete spin on is a, a little bit of the developer experience for registering apps. Um, so I can show you kind of the, the pathway that I've used as a developer to register apps with the Epic portals, uh, maybe just to set a baseline. Uh, but I'm also happy to discuss kind of any aspects of either the, the regulations or the rollout that we're likely to see. Um, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture, but I do want to be realistic about the things that are working today. Um, so does it does it make sense? To, I, I know John got yeah. to see the, the patient oriented video that I that I put out yesterday. Naveen, did you get a chance to watch that too? I did. Uh, it was okay. fabulous. It answered a lot of my questions already. I had some other pointed questions, but I'll take your lead, Josh, in how you want to uh, go through this. Yeah, so let's do a quick sort of demo and tour of some of the developer side of that experience, because you know yesterday's video was kind of as as a patient, what do you see? Uh, so yeah. I'll show you a little bit of the behind the scenes, and then just we can open up for for discussion. 
So let me just turn on a screen share here. Um, so while you're turning it on, uh, Naveen, yeah. I, I think given your background, um, I'd like to invite you to uh, uh, participate with HL7's new newest work group, the Patient Empowerment Group. Um, they're, they're, you know, I think uh, hitting on a couple of the topics, and I think you come with a perspective that would really be helpful. Sure, absolutely, John. Would love I'm not to a co-chair there, uh, but I'm a founder uh, of, of the group, and and I try to hang on as tight as I can, but uh, sure. Uh, there's only so many uh, things I can be co-chair of. Yeah, thanks. So go go ahead, Josh. Well, yeah. Um, so John made the good point that um, everything I showed in my video yesterday, and I think everything I'm going to show today is kind of epic oriented. Uh, I don't want to suggest that there's vendor monoculture here. It's just that my healthcare providers use epic. And so this is like when I want to actually be able to test these systems, this is kind of what I can most easily see. Um, and I, I will say that epic has done a good job of getting out there with developer tools that kind of scale well. Although I, I think by now Cerner has a, a very similar set of tools. We can look at their developer platform um, a little bit, but I, won't, I don't think I'll be able to you know, sign in and show you a real world app in this context. Um, did I do that wrong? I typed code.com instead of code.cerner.com. Um, that'll help. So Cerner uh, does have a very similar API, you know, front end for the for the programmer, but I don't know about the patient experience. So that was one of the things I pointed to you, Josh, is I think your your presentation from before really ought to uh, see if we can get similar presentations on some of the other uh, major uh, platforms, because that's that's really helpful to a patient to go, oh, it's not that hard. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it would be great to put together kind of a, a little portfolio of these examples. Uh, I'll say in my own testing, I have been comfortable sharing my portal username and password with people like other developers in the field who, who wanted to get like a more in-depth sense of some of this stuff. And, and the vendors do have sandboxes that, do, yep. that show you the OAuth approval process from the patient side. You know, the branding is a little different because it's not coming from a real clinical practice, um, but they do a pretty good job of um, providing kind of a high fidelity um, sandbox of what their real world approval looks like. Um, so I won't spend a, a ton of time on this one uh, on, on the Cerner side, but like you'll see all of these certified EHR vendors have a portal that's something like this, which will have information about how to get started and, and also information about kind of fees. And the interesting thing from the uh, perspective of patient access is that the, the ONC certification program ensures that there are no fees for patient access. Um, so patient app developers and the patients themselves aren't being charged in this context. Uh, and, and what does that mean? So if a patient uses a third party app. Yeah, uh, to fetch the data does the third party app still have to incur the fees. Uh, well, the, the key question is whether the patient is invoking their right to access and the patient is choosing that app. Yeah. Um, and so in that context, if you're like a third party app developer that you know, you want to offer something directly to patients. You can do that. You can register your app with these vendor systems, and the vendors have to make it available to the providers who are their customers. And patients need to be able to choose if they want to share their data with your app. They can make that choice. And throughout that loop, the patient is not being charged, and you're not being charged. You, the developer of that app. Uh, the story is totally different if you're building provider facing apps um, or if you're looking to use. Uh, what the regulations call value added features in the EHR that go beyond this kind of core data set. Um, but that's that's kind of the, the starting point. Patient access. Yeah, let's keep that thought uh, or, yeah. on the side for a moment. I yeah, yeah. have more questions on that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we can, we can come back to it. Um, anyway, so from from the perspective on the the Cerner side, you know, you'll see very similar stories from uh, other vendors, and you know, typically there's some kind of a app registration step or a developer registration step. Um, this kind of flow chart uh, is really oriented towards provider facing apps. So you know, this idea that the app is being validated by Cerner and there could be a 14 week delay. Those might apply to provider facing apps where there's a, uh, you know, the vendor might be involved in the decision to approve the app or reject it, uh, where they might ask for changes. These, these considerations, this flow chart does not apply to patient facing apps. The, the regulations are clear that uh, the vendor only has a limited amount of time. I think it's maybe two business days or five. I forget, but it's less than a week to um, process the registration request for your app. And they are not allowed to validate the app per se. 
Um, the only thing they really can check is um, to vet the identity of the app developer so they can include an a ID checking process of some kind so that they know who the developer is. But they can't make approval decisions based on that. So, you know, again, this just sort of calls to attention the difference between the patient facing world and the provider facing world. The technologies are exactly the same, but the, the regulations around how things are, are approved or, or uh, put into production are quite different. The, the locus of control is different. So on the on the Epic side, um, there are actually two different domains. There's fire.epic.com, which is where all the app registration happens these days. But um, sort of the, the earlier site, open.epic.com, still has one really important piece of information, which is uh, under this fire menu here, the fire endpoints list. So this is where Epic publishes um, yeah. uh, their, their sandbox endpoints, but also all of their production endpoints for their customers that have this, these APIs deployed. Um, so they have- and yeah. can I interrupt you there? What's the sure. difference between what's the difference between a DSTU two and STU three and R four? What are those exactly? So those all refer to versions of the Fire standard that have been published over the years. Um, the the ones that you'll see for most vendors uh, in the U.S. are um, DSTU two, which sort of goes back to 2016 or so. It was the first version of Fire that they put in production, typically. Um, so we had a project called Argonaut that really brought together a lot of focus around DSTU2 back, you know, eight years ago. Um, but these days, all the action is in what's called Fire R4, and that is the version that's named in the U.S. regulations. So every certified product is going to have to have Fire R4 endpoints. Um, the vendors that are that are careful about it will keep their old endpoints up and keep them working, um, you know, to avoid breaking apps that are deployed in production. But this is what's actually certified requirement today. Understood. And the so these URLs, these base URLs that you're seeing, there is additional documentation that says how to contact the authorization server, for example, using these base URLs and how to make the additional calls. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So you know, if I if I look at any one of these. Um, there's uh, a metadata endpoint that you can access by appending, I mean, this is all just part of the standard, but if I append slash metadata to this, I will get, um, you know, what really should be a JSON file, but I have to update my format and say format equals JSON, and, you know, then I get something like this. And, you know, of the various data in here, you will find the authorization URL, so it's like the OAuth endpoint that yeah. you redirect people to when you want to go through this OAuth process. Um, and I don't know if Epic has actually launched this, but they will add support for this maybe simpler discovery mechanism, well-known smart configuration. The last time I checked, it's not live yet, uh, but they have gotten live with it now. Um, and they have an interesting way of returning an XML file here if you don't have the right content type. But anyway, you can get a sense of the information here, which is um, the OAuth token endpoint and the OAuth authorization endpoint, and then a set of features that this implementation of Epic supports. So they support, you know, what's called public clients and confidential clients, and uh, they support single sign-on. Uh, so you can learn this kind of stuff from their discovery documents. Got it. Um, and Josh, how did you how did you get to that uh, original? Uh, you, I mean, did you just cut and paste one of those original URLs? Yeah. Was, uh, well, so yeah, for manual demonstration here, I just copied and pasted this URL, yeah. and then I appended either slash metadata or dot well known slash smart configuration. And the, the smart app launch specification is what sort of describes how all those pieces work. Got it. Uh, so Epic and, and, and are you also aware whether all of these? You know, obviously uh, these are. Uh, organization specific base URLs, but are these all on a hosted version of Epic where everyone is sharing the same? Is, is Epic multi tenant? That is, is advan for example, our advantage care physicians and Advent Health on the yeah. same um, hosted version of Epic? Right. So, I mean, there's two answers to your question. The first answer is it doesn't matter. And as an app developer, you shouldn't have to care. Uh, all you need to know is. This is a set of endpoints that you can connect to, and uh, the way to register for all these endpoints is to register your app with Epic. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the abstraction barrier that we try to set up. Um, for the real answer, uh, there's diversity here. So most of these customers are, or many of these customers are going to be self-hosted Epic sites. Some of these will be uh, hosted by Epic in Epic's cloud. You know, it's really a mix. There may be other deployment models too. Um, 
the ones that say epic proxy dot et something 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 dot epic hosted dot com that's probably right. a good indication that uh, those are being hosted by epic directly but it, it should not matter for you as an app developer one way or the other yeah. um and you know cloud hosted vendors like uh like athena health uh it really is just like a multi-tenant central thing and they they host all the infrastructure cerner has kind of an interesting hybrid model where uh, their individual customers might all be hosting their own infrastructure on-prem, but Cerner hosts a centralized kind of proxy that accesses them all, so all the apps come in through their proxy. Epic's architecture is much more distributed, and we'll, we'll get a sense of that actually when we look at their registration portal. You'll, you'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Um, but for now, I mean, the, the bottom line is this is almost all of Epic's customers in the U.S. Um, I, don't, I don't know what all the sort of hard numbers are, but, you know, if you look at this bundle resource right now, which is a fire JSON resource. And we just ask bundle.entries.length. Uh, it looks like there's about 400 that are they're running the, the fire R4 version today. Um, I don't know how many different health systems Epic has today in the US, but this is this is like a very large subset of them. And the expectation is by the end of the year, this should be basically everyone. Um, but you know, you can you can search here and look look site by site and get a sense. One of the challenges with with this um, file today is you don't really get a ton of metadata. You get the name of the health system and that's kind of it. So yeah. for some of these, it can be a little confusing. Like, yeah. you know, if you're a patient at a hospital called Mercy, like there's a lot of Mercies that kind of look the same. And like, is this Mercy Medical Center the one that I mean or not? Um, yeah. So we have a project underway, sort of working with the EHR community to provide more metadata here. Um, locations, logos, uh, patient portal URLs, uh, health system, customer facing URLs really to augment this data set so that um, apps can present a meaningful set of information that patients can recognize. Um, so that's that's what's called the Argonaut uh, Patient Access Brands Project. Uh, and Epic has been participating some, there. some of that information in it as well. The, the endpoints were decorated, but yes, this isn't really a directory. This is just a list. Y yeah, that's right. Um, and it's worth saying, Again, the regulations call for this. The regulations require each vendor to publish a list. They don't say what the format has to be, but a list of all the endpoints. Um, and so you're gonna see centralized at the vendor level, these kinds of lists from each vendor. There may be other useful formats as well. Somebody might roll these up and publish a centralized directory. That could be very valuable, but uh, each vendor is at least gonna have this kind of list to meet the regulations. Um, so that's. That's the main thing to know about on the open.epic site, at least from my perspective. And then if I go to fire.epic.com, this is really where they have all their, their documentation and uh, app registration tools. So the, the home page of this is kind of an overview of all the APIs they support. Uh, from a patient access perspective, when we're talking about building these free apps that patients can approve, uh, there's a couple of things to look out for. If you, if you look at all these different fire resources that they support and all these different operations that they support, um, if you drill in here and say, you know, observation vital signs read fire R4. This is kind of the, the piece that's going to let us see like what a patient's blood pressures were. Um, if we're a patient facing app, you can see these pages are a little slow to load and then it can be a little misleading when they first load. They just have this information about errors. And then if you sit there and wait for several seconds, the actual content pops in. So that's a oh, little gotcha there. That. Yeah. Um, Oh, this is new, this try it button. But what I wanted to show you is this little pill here that says USCDI V1. Um, that means that this, this data type is one that Epic has identified as part of the US core data for interoperability uh, version one. So this is the stuff that patient apps are guaranteed to be able to get for free. And anything that doesn't have this little pill icon uh, that says USCDI might not be available for the free kind of patient apps. So it's like it's an important distinction. It's, it's a small one here, but it'll play out in a big way when it comes to the app registration step. Um, and since this button is new, I can't help but uh, try it. What is this going to yeah. do? Gives me a little sidebar. Gives me a little template. I'll, first I try it, then I try it out. Uh, cool. So this is kind of like a JSON rendering in a table. Um, that lets me like see what one of these vital signs objects looks like, which is pretty neat. Uh, and then I can see the raw response down here. This is like, you know, what the fire, uh, Epic Fire Sandbox returns with. So it's this observation with a vital signs category and so on. Blood pressure observation, systolic, diastolic, great. 
so so they have this overview, all the different data types that they support. Um, the important ones are going to be the ones that are labeled as US CDI V1, um, and that set will grow over time. Uh, we're already almost ready for US CDI V3 by, the, uh, by this point in time. Uh, so every year the ONC expands their definitions. But as a go, go, go back to that sheet again where you yeah uh, yeah the, the the different categories that you had um, uh, there yeah go to the yeah so and are these category have these categories been uh, formalized within fire would would uh, Cerner return similar categories same categories what so the, if we ignore the parentheses for a moment and just focus on the words in front of the parentheses those these words are almost all uh, fire resource types. So mm -hmm. those have been standardized uh, quite broadly. So allergy intolerance is a fire resource, observation, flag, goal. These all represent different fire resources. Where things yeah. get more interesting is when we get into all the various profiles on fire resources. So the condition resource in fire could be used for your problem list, but it could also be used to code the reason for a visit, which is subtly different and could be used to encode genomics conditions or health concerns or infections. And these are all different kind of categories of conditions, if you will. Um, and these don't all have well-defined fire profiles that are widely agreed on. And so oftentimes what you'll see is, uh, you know, vendors will build support for these core resources, and then they might define five subflavors that they want to surface as distinct subflavors, even though the standards are often just focused on um, the aggregate. Understood. So, so there is there is going to be there is still going to be a lot of uh, you know a vendor specific programming that you would need to do. Yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, I mean, if things are working as they should, a client application can ask for a list of all conditions associated with Naveen's record, and uh -huh. they should be able to cut across all these different subtypes, and everything they get will be valid fire condition resources. So you don't necessarily need to care about these distinctions. Uh, an EPIC system that stores this information in five different database tables under the hood might need to care about it so it can figure out which bits of the internal data model to query for for these different yeah. reasons. Um, yeah, but and there still, might be... I think these are these subcategories do make uh, some sense, right? Like if you were interested in just the genomics oriented conditions, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, uh, but but let's say there's something like that and you, you want to build that category, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, classification within your own system. Yes. Then, then you would need to know what that is, right? And and this it might be called genomics here. It might be called genomic someplace else. It might be called something something different in a different uh, EMR system. Yep. So that that does introduce. Uh, you know, if you just wanted to get everything that is conditioned and you didn't care about classifying the conditions any further, then yes, probably. So so that is true. Um, I, I will just say like briefly, if you look at the fire condition data model. Um, a condition can actually have an array of categories that sort of yeah. tell you how to classify it. And then we, in the core fire spec, we have what's called a preferred value set, which means you really should use condition categories from this value set if they apply. Uh -huh. And and so, you know, even if you don't know anything about the way that Epic has organized their conditions and what subclasses they've defined, if you know the core spec and if you know things like uh, this preferred categories value set, then you can see, you know, maybe at least you'll be able to recognize problem list items and encounter diagnoses. But yeah. this preferred value set doesn't get it to the level of genomic conditions versus yeah. health concerns. So that's, I think that's a good reflection of kind of where we are today as a community. Yeah. Um, the, the other the places where those uh, subcategories are defined are in various implementation guides. That's right. uh, which are our augmentations, specializations of the fire core spec. But as Josh is indicating, um, if you approach the API using pure fire core, um, you're, you're going to get all the data um, yeah. and it will be coded. It will be structured. Um, uh, it just, you know, uh, it might be more understandable if you understood that implementation guide. Yeah, but it really shouldn't be that much more understandable on a receiving side. It's more right. how if you are going to be describing an observation about a genomics uh, uh, observation, what is the proper way to describe it? Uh, that, so it's it's far more about how to properly describe than, than how to consume. Consume should be pretty off the shelf. Yeah. 
That's exactly and, right. And as Josh is pointing out, there are even some profiles in FireCore like the vital signs. Yeah, that's that's right. So so the, the most relevant profiles for you will be the ones that um, that are standardized at the US level. So the US, Fire US Core profiles say, yeah, we know there's various sub flavors of observations and we're specifically going to describe clinical tests, images, sexual orientation observations, social history observations, smoking status, vitals, and so on. So those actually are pretty well standardized in the US context, but vendors can also go deeper and define some of their own uh, more nuanced flavors of these things if they want in a compatible way. Yeah. All right, so if you're going to build an app that can connect to these APIs, um, you know, there's there's a lot of good documentation that Epic provides about how all this stuff works, and I have to admit I have not read it all. So if I say some things that that seem funny or wrong, it's it's probably because I'm wrong. Uh, but I have sort of stumbled through this process enough that I at least have an intuitive sense of of how it works. And you know, you can see from my account here, I've got um, a few apps, most of which one, two, three, four, five of these are just like five different registrations of maybe slightly different variants of, of this same app called Procure, uh, which is the one I showed in the demo yesterday. Um, and part of that was just me stumbling around and making some mistakes in the registration process and needing to start over um, because it is a pretty locked down registration process. Once you finish registering your app, if you realize you did something wrong, uh, the way to fix it is to start a new registration. Um, so there, there can be kind of a sharp learning curve here, but I will, you know, take you through kind of the, the basics of this, just so you can see what's what's in scope. And there's a couple aspects. Why, why do you have to start a new new registration? I mean, I'm assuming yeah, so I've, you I've, have reuse those some of the metadata that you associate with the registration process. Uh, sorry, say again, Naveen. Could you not just reuse some of the metadata that you use for the yeah. registration process? Just change your app. You could. Uh, it's just right now, the way Epic has built this site, it requires you to type up, type it all in again or copy and paste it. There's there's no like easy button that says, I want to make an app registration that looks just like this one, except I want to tweak a few things. That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, you know, probably uh, on Epic's development roadmap that this is this is a pretty, pretty clear opportunity. Um, yeah. But this is how it works today. If you want to register a, an app, whether it's totally novel or very, very similar to your last one. You just start a new one. So uh, you you define this audience up front. You declare whether it's a patient facing app and this mm -hmm. is what's going to put you in a you know certain set of categories in terms of the approval process. And Epic surfaces this kind of list of various API calls that a patient facing app is allowed to register for. And so we were looking at uh, observations before, right? Uh, oh, so you have to you have to you have to indicate all of the APIs that your app is using. You have to indicate one by one all the APIs that your app is using, and uh, this this is like a little bit um, challenging. But let's say I want to get access to vital signs and social history. Um, you know, you know, what? I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hit the save button because I I want to show you something that actually isn't surfaced on this screen yet. It's kind of a UI bug. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just do example.org as my redirect URL and let me say it's a confidential client just because that maybe is a little bit more interesting in terms of the workflow here. Should Epic require refresh tokens when authenticating? I was never able to understand what that meant. I have an outstanding question to the Epic team, but um, I think we can avoid doing anything there for now. And Epic has this interesting model where, okay, if you want to talk to their sandbox, first you'll get a secret to talk to their sandbox. Um, and what they do is they generate a secret and then they hash that secret and they're going to hold on to um, the hashed value. Uh, you can click the store hash button to make sure we save the secure version of your secret. So <laughs> if you don't click that button, you're really in trouble. So it's a good thing that they give you the button to click. But I think maybe I'm supposed to copy this one. This is a little, a little quirky. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to hit save because now that I've hit save, if I scroll down to the bottom, there's more stuff on this page. And in particular, there's this tiny little note down here that says client IDs for this app will not be automatically downloaded to customer systems upon marking it ready for production. Um, what does that mean? This is truly mysterious, but very important. 
uh, you it, you really want this to say will be automatically downloaded. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a very bad time trying to scale your app distribution. Uh, what this means is if you pick the right settings and register your app you know, with, within the right parameters that Epic has prescribed, your app will be automatically broadcast to those 400 Epic sites and patients at any one of those 400 sites will be able to connect. Mm. That's, that's what we want. If this says will not be automatically connected, what this means is that by default, you can register an app, but it won't actually be available anywhere. And you'll have to somehow call up every one of those 400 sites yourself and somehow find somebody to talk to and convince them to go in and turn on support for your app, uh, which is a total non-starter if you're a patient-facing app. So um, how, do you, how do you go from will not to point. will? Uh, you, you, you can read more about it here, but let me, let me see. I actually thought I was picking selections that was going to say will. So let's see. I was going to say gonna... one of the reasons why you may want this mode is you are prototyping and this isn't, you know, this isn't a, a application intended for production. So you don't want everybody to hear about it you want it to be used you know on a one by one basis but uh, yeah i agree it seems a strange default well yeah and i mean to be clear it's it's not about whether people will hear about your app because these when i register my app here it's not published anywhere nobody discovers it just because yeah. of that it's just if i tell people where my app lives they can use it um and if i want to lock down access to my app I, you know generally i have to do that on my side anyway uh let me see if i can pick the right choices i i thought uh, that by selecting only data types that were part of the Fire US Core version one and uh, generating my app that way, I thought I was going to be on the good side of that flag. But mm -hmm. let me let me just uncheck confidential client for a second. Uh, let me make this box happy. And then say that I accept the terms. I uh, thought that might do the trick, but it doesn't. So let me just say I'm ready for sandbox testing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to just open that app right back up again. So you can see this is now an app in the draft stage. Uh, this is the fun thing about a live demo. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, <laughs> the, so, so I wanted to show you one other thing. And let me show you that anyway. Um, I wanted to show you the questionnaire. So Epic has this data use questionnaire that they surface to all app developers. And the idea is they're going to ask the developer to make certain representations about the app. And those responses get shown to the user at approval time. Uh, and they've generally been quite thoughtful about these questions. I'm sorry, what do you mean by to the user at approval time? Well, so like in my demo yesterday, when I said I wanted to connect to my data at Unity Point Health, yeah. I got displayed a screen after I signed yeah. into my health account that said, hey, this app is going to sell your data or it's going to use your data for these marketing purposes, those kinds of things. Yeah. All of that came from this kind of questionnaire that the developer filled out at registration time. Wow. And this is obviously not a perfect science. This is Epic trying to come up with a set of questions that are going to be useful for people. And as an app developer, you go through, you know, step by step, you answer each one of these questions. And not that I want to do a very slow live demo here, but I'm thinking now that my answers to these questions, like the fact that I haven't filled out this survey, might actually be what easiness. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't think that's right, but it's the the only it's the next thing I can think to try. Yeah, um, and so anyway, these are interesting questions that Epic developed. They were trying to figure out, you know, what would be meaningful for patients, and I will say they've done a pretty good job of, you know, covering the basics. And you know, the nice thing about this is, of course, my app is going to have a privacy policy anyway that spells out all this stuff. But there's no way real human beings can read that privacy policy and make any sense of it. So this forces app developers to kind of describe their policy at a higher level. And it also puts them, I think, on the hook from an enforcement perspective. If, if the app developer says they're not going to store user data and then they go ahead and store it, well, they've, they've made this representation, even if it's not in their privacy policy. Um, and the FTC might be willing to go after app developers if they have deceptive practices in that regard. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the challenges with this questionnaire is they've had two different versions over the years, and I guess some Epic customers are on older versions of Epic, and they only support the older questionnaire, so you just get to do everything again. And these are very, very similar questions, but not quite identical, uh, and so you have to fill out, like, both copies of the questionnaire, and wow. it, it's, it's, you know, this is not the most pleasant process, but 
you know, you could probably do it in five minutes or, or an hour, and it's not going to be the thing that stops your app from making it out, out into the world. So this is, you know, what I would describe as painful, but but not not particularly a roadblock. The challenge is if you wanted to do this with 300 different vendors, each of which have their own questions, their own process, um, I think it would be quickly become unworkable. Um, so we will see, and we are starting to see already, the emergence of app developer platforms that just do this once and then sort of resell the the developer services downstream with their pre-registered copy of an app. Um, and the more painful this process is, I think the more common those kinds of platforms will be. Okay, so I just filled out the questionnaires. Let's see if that got me to yes. I'm still on no. Uh, well, you know, something has changed for sure since the last time I did this. Let me just pick a slightly different scope just to see if that changes anything. I'm going to do um, allergy intolerance search. So that's the only thing my app wants. It's going to be an allergy management app. <laughs> um, still says will not. Well, uh, this is the fun thing about a live demo is you always learn something new. Uh, I will follow up with the Epic team and figure out, you know, maybe I'm just overlooking something or maybe the site has changed or broken um, in some way. If, if either of you spots anything, let me know. Um, the yeah, so the, the challenge here is, I, well, I won't get to show you the next step on this app, but I'll just show it to you on one of the apps that I've already registered. Cool. And and by the way, Josh, uh, do some of the other vendors they have similar registration mechanisms? Um, similar, yes. In general, um, this the Epic registration system is is kind of maybe most interesting because of the way that they broadcast out the client IDs. Yeah. If you register an app that needs to keep a secret, Epic will sort of help you generate four hundred different secrets, one for each one of their clients. And they do that because they don't want to know the secrets that your app is going to use to authenticate to their various uh, customers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I haven't seen other vendors who have built their registration system with quite that architecture. So that's maybe the most interesting aspect. The other thing Epic does, which is I think unique or at least unusual, is they they require you to select these scopes ahead of time. So you have to commit ahead of time to saying exactly what uh, API calls your app will or won't be able to make. And once you lock these in, you cannot change them ever. And mm. uh, if you ask for, if you register for, you know, 12 different categories of data, um, oftentimes in an OAuth flow, when your app launches, it could request any subset of those 12. You could say, well, my app in general is able to access all these aspects of the record, but I know this user is only trying to draw a growth chart right now. So I only want the vital signs so I can see heights and weights. Uh, but the way the Epic registration works is you, your app, no matter what you ask for at runtime, is always going to be processed as though it was asking for all the scopes that it registered for. Um, so that's maybe another interesting quirk uh, or a slightly distinctive behavior here. Is there, is there like nothing that's in, but, in but, red? But, but I think we've come a long way. You know, uh, 15 years ago, it was just a dream to be able to get this kind of data out of a system. Yes. So at yeah. Least now in the year 2022, we are able to do it. That's fantastic. Yeah. No. It's a it's a huge amount of progress. Um, and you know, quirks aside, uh, this you know this this does work. And I've been certainly able to register apps that um, connect across these various sites. So let me show you with you know we'll do the cooking show trick, and I'll pull one out of the oven already baked. Let me show you one of these apps that I already registered in the past. Um, one of these copies of Procure. And the idea here is they have this, this page that says uh, it's about managing keys. This is sort of, I mentioned each site gets, a, you know, you might have a, a secret that's shared individually with each different Epic customer. If you build a confidential client, a kind of client that needs a secret, um, then you'll get sort of the ability to register. And what, and what does that mean when you say a, a, a sort of different customers of Epic? have different security implementations where some may request a client secret, others may not? Uh, no, so so we make the distinction at the app level in, in the Smart on Fire spec. We say some app architectures are what OAuth calls public clients. So if you're building an app that runs natively on my Android phone or an app that runs entirely in the web browser, 
you can't keep a secret. Like all the app code is somehow visible to me as the user. So that you can't yeah. have some secret key because every every copy of your app would be bundling that key with it. So we call those public clients and uh, they don't need access tokens or, or sorry, they don't, they don't need um, clients. Right. Um, their, their security is through the redirect URL, through the fact that they're hosted at a domain or um, with a redirect URL that is secured. And so if you register your app as a public client, you don't need to manage these keys at all. Yep. Um, if you register your app as a confidential client, like let's say you have a conventional server side app that is you know, running in a secure server center somewhere, maybe in a secure cloud environment, and you can keep secrets there and use them to authenticate, then you would get a different secret for each um, Epic customer in this case that your app needs to connect to. So they have this kind of interface for being able to access those secrets. Um, more and more these days, they are uh, supporting asymmetric authentication. And the, the latest version of Smart supports this so that you don't have to manage a separate shared secret with 500 sites. You can just have one set of uh, public private key pair and all 500 sites can learn about your public key and you can rotate it when you need to. So that's, that's the more common method for newer apps. Um, Anyway, that's that's basically the app kind of registration portal uh, experience inside of Epic. You can see, you know, this is an example of of an app where uh, it's been registered at only a subset of the sites, um, and you know, you can go one by one and say, all right, if I need a shared secret with Advent Health, I'm going to come in here and create a new shared secret and like somehow save this to my app's environment. So they have a testing and a not and, and a production version. And I would, I guess the idea is I would come in here and I would save each one of these and then hit enable and then test it and hit confirm somehow. And I guess the idea is I would do that by hand 400 times or 500 times, uh, uh, which seems pretty unworkable. Um, yeah. So I have to imagine that they are working on some kind of a automation for this. I'm just hoping, but all the apps that I've registered and worked with myself have been public clients, so I haven't really had to deal with um, that kind of secret management. I only, I only registered a confidential client to sort of check that out and see what it looked like. Um, but that's a view into both some of the things that work and also some of the, the quirky or, or painful bits. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to show in terms of their site. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of sad, but not totally shocked. I'm that the that the registration said will not be broadcast. So I'll, I'll follow up and I'll let you know what the answer is for that. And just a mundane question for all those. Go ahead, John. Well, the, 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 I'm guessing that uh, as you're noticing, Josh, with the scalability questions, there's probably a whole nother workflow now to, to propagate that uh, they've had to switch over to. So maybe there is no way to satisfy that, you know, will not versus will. Um, at registration, at first registration, it's only after. It it might be. I feel like there's there's just some quirk or bug, but we'll see yeah. where it goes. I think I think maybe Josh, what you can help is uh, you can if when you reach out to your friends at Epic, I think it'll be worthwhile to understand when does it become a will not versus when does it stay as a will. Oh you know, yeah, I mean, so they, they do have documentation there. Re reading it live is a little tricky just because there's a bunch of details. But the, the last time I read it, it basically boiled down to, are you requesting only data types that are part of the US core data set? And if you restrict your data types to that set, it says will. And if you ask for something more, it says will not. That's, you know, that's how it worked a month ago. Uh, now there's either something that changed or a bug, so I'll I'll compare the docs and see what changed. And and then even if it even if you if you go beyond the uh, standard US code data set, where it says will not, and then so so to for you to be able to access individually every system every um, implementation's data, um, do you have to go through just that process of key enablement at that point in time or? Do you no, have to I, reach out to someone there in that organization? Yeah, if, if it says will not, I think it means you got to convince somebody at each organization uh, that, that they want to turn your app on. I think that's the current state. And I mean, what that basically means is good luck. Yeah. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're just trying to work with one or two hospitals, like because 
because they want you to do something for them or with them, like great. But if you're trying to build a patient facing experience that just works at scale, you, you're really not going to find success outside of that core data set. Yeah, got it. Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be as a patient app. You shouldn't have to have it uh, propagated to all. Well, so let's say I'm building a patient app. I, I haven't, you're, you're going to be my customer, but we haven't met yet. I'm just going to publish my app like in the Apple App Store or the Android Play, Play Store. You find my app in the Play Store, you start my app and you say, oh, great. My doctor, you know, in Milwaukee is this healthcare provider. I've never heard of that healthcare provider before. I certainly don't know anyone there that I can call and say, hey, John just downloaded my app. Can you turn it on, please? Like, I'm stuck. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe another in, uh, question: Are there uh, other middlemen that have act, that have connected to all of these different installations? That you know, someone like uh, someone like a new player in the market can just connect to them. So yeah, I mentioned that the, you know, it, if this registration process is too hard, I think more more and more usage will focus on those kinds of uh, middleware service providers. Uh, so the answer is yeah, there there are certainly companies in that category, um, you know, one that comes to mind is like OneUp Health. Um, I think they have connections to, to various health systems that, that work just the way that I've shown, but they've gone through the registration step already and configured the clients and, and then they kind of offer downstream developers an opportunity to ride on those rails. Got it. Um, and, you know, from a technical perspective, I think that's okay. Um, but I, I kind of wish that the system was easier to use and didn't require, didn't didn't steer people that way. The challenge is as a patient, you know, I wanna use Naveen's cool app to do a cool thing. I would like to say, I trust Naveen and his cool app. Uh, I know what he's doing for me. He, I have a, relation, a business relationship, like this is, this is clean and clear. But instead, if I have to trust some sort of middleware app that's supporting Naveen and 500 other app developers, and you know, I don't know them or what they're gonna do with the data, like. I'd rather not have to say yes to that. That's so right. It does get a little bit um, challenging from that perspective yeah. of transparency sure. and trust. Yeah. So this was great, uh, Josh. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm glad this time worked. Um, John, I'm happy to stay on if there's other follow up I, items that you want to talk through. I have a couple of more yeah. questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, don't. Neither of you should feel compelled to, but, but I'll stick around until we've worked through it. Yeah. So uh, you remember we had also spoken about pairs, and yes, your your presentation, the the the, uh, the video that you had sent me yesterday, I watched that as well, and you said that some of that is coming. But I I know that in our conversation you had mentioned that there are some other third party you know people who are who are keeping track of pairs that have provided or publicly enabled some endpoints to possibly get claims data. Is that right? Um, and I'm trying to remember. So, so Mark Scrimshire is the person that I talked to. He's, he's, you know, worked at CMS and then subsequently has worked on some uh, payer tooling platforms. And he showed me at the Developer Days conference uh, last month a website that he had built that services just this kind of a list of payer endpoints. It had a cute name, but the name did not stick with me. And I'm, I'm trying to search for it now. Um, I'm I'm gonna have to just reach out to Mark and and ask him. I'll I'll ping him right now and see if he responds uh, while oh. we're still chatting. I'm sorry. What's his name again, Mark? Mark Scrimshire. Scrimsh. How do you say that last name? S C R I M S H I R E. Oh, Scrimshire. Right. This is yeah. very cool. It did answer all my questions. So I think the only issue that client facing applications are going to have is the usual stuff with managing your access tokens and your refresh tokens. At the end of the day, the refresh tokens will have a lifetime, you know, and so when the, when the refresh tokens expire, you have no choice but to ask the users to enter their login details again. Yeah, and this is an important point too that I, that I didn't get into. Uh, different vendors have sort of put different lines in the sand here. 
the regulations require that at least confidential clients be able to get um, refresh tokens for long-term access. It needs to last for at least three months at a time and to be refreshable to last for another three months. That's kind of built into the regs. But like if you go to register an app with, with the Epic portal today, if you register for a confidential client, you can ask for refresh tokens. If you register for a public client, you can't. You're limited to one hour access. Well, I got it. Well, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to protect the refresh token. Yeah. I mean, we could debate this. I I mean otherwise you'd be a confidential client. So if I'm storing the refresh token in a user's web browser, I can protect that refresh token from everybody but that user. And that's good enough, right? If I'm protecting a client secret, the point is that you can't expose that to the user because the client secret is shared across users. But refresh tokens are unique per user. Um, and so it's okay if John knows John's refresh token. The problem is if John knows Naveen's refresh token. Uh, yeah. That's oversimplifying. I'm, I'm not saying there's no discussion of the point, but but anyway, that's sort of where things have landed right now is if you're building a confidential client, you you are definitely going to be able to ask for a refresh token. If you're building a public client, you may or may not, depending on what the vendor has configured. That's right. And what I think will happen is that developers will just lie and say they have a confidential client no matter what they're doing if they want refresh tokens, because that's the way to get refresh tokens. So in terms of actual meaningful protection, uh, that's what it'll boil down to. Yeah, got it. This was great. Josh, I really want to thank you I sure. think this uh, this uh, basically answers uh, the questions that I had, uh, and and uh, Mark, it was a pleasure to meet you. And you know, it, um, Josh, if I have any additional questions, maybe I'll reach out to you um, uh, separately on an, on the email. Uh, yeah, but in the meantime, good. yeah, if you can if you can uh, get uh, Epic to respond to your questions about you know will not and will and uh, you know yeah. things of that kind, that'll be great. I'll get to the bottom of this. And when, when I post this video, I'll also include in the notes uh, what the resolution was for that. Yeah. Thank you awesome. so much for your time. Yeah. Sounds Take good. Care. All right, guys. I'm going to turn off recording. Thanks to you both. Bye. Take care.